Hello, I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, the Internet term going viral took on new significance this week, only this time referring to an actual virus. We'll look tonight at the web of policies and precautions, and also at the latest from the Hard Rock demolition, where the progress to date is anything but viral. Our Future Watch segment looks at plans for City Park, and we will examine the politics of presidential primaries. We will also discuss a bar skirmish on Frenchman Street at which state troopers may have made an unfair arrest. Joining us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Dave Cohen, News Director, WWL Radio, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4. All right, Dave, we're going to go over to you first um, because just the whole world is just rolling and rocking with this virus, with the coronavirus, and it's now come home to roost, too. We have, you know, we see increasing numbers here in the state of Louisiana in the New Orleans region. So what are we learning from this? Well, we're learning that things unfolded as everyone kind of expected they would. If you want to talk about the good news first, it's that New Orleans, Louisiana had time to not only watch what happened globally, but also across the country. And officials here were determined not to be Seattle. In fact, we heard those words from City Hall that we're not going to be Seattle, that we're going to get ahead of this thing, we're going to make preparations, we're going to have a plan, and we know it's coming. It was inevitable cases would start popping up here, and they did. And this week, we have seen the progression of those plans now unfolding with the understanding that there's still so many unknowns mm -hmm. so fluid. associated with this. Yeah, that's that's kind of the word of the week is right. fluid. But of course, the best laid plans would have had many, many more tests available, and they were not. So right. that has actually put not just New Orleans, but Louisiana and the rest of the country behind the epidemic without widespread testing. And because there weren't enough tests, the criteria for testing people was so high, mm -hmm. the threshold to test an individual for the virus was so high that people were walking around with it, with symptoms, but because they did not specifically match the criteria that had been set up for the few tests available, they weren't tested. So they were able to spread the virus everywhere they went for days or weeks without anyone knowing they had it. So well, now we're into Unlike that. the flu, which everybody keeps saying, well, it's like the flu, this one lasts longer on surfaces, it's dormant, and you don't have symptoms when you actually already have the virus for many more days than with the flu, so it's just much easier to spread it to one another right. without the, even knowing you're spreading because it. Because it's called the novel coronavirus, we have not, as a population, built up immunities to it, so we're, we're no, just right. much so, more susceptible yeah, to Yeah, we don't have the immunities. It. Plus, furthermore, on your point is young people, healthy people, and particularly children, have extremely mild cases or no symptoms at all. So they are vectors. They're walking around not knowing because they're not in any way demonstrating they're carrying the virus. And, you know, they go give mama a hug. They're happily and, spreading it without knowing. And this, well, that's a good news, bad news scenario, which is the symptoms are mild, but it makes it much more easy to spread. And scientists are now, you know, sorting out sort of the epidemiology of it all that this seems to be more easily transmittable than the flu. Yeah, so we can expect, we know when flu hits an area, there's an outbreak, a lot of people get it, you know, percentages of classes at school say stay home sick. This could, you know, far exceed that. Yeah, the conservative estimates are 30% of everybody in will... In the country. Yeah, 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 in the country, will get the coronavirus. Now, it's disproportionately impacting people with hypertension, high blood pressure, and who are elderly or have underlying illnesses, mm -hmm. much, much more than the flu. The flu is far more of an equal opportunity uh, infector. This, like we said, the young people tend not to get very much impact at all in terms of symptoms and, and impact, but the elderly and people with hypertension and other underlying illnesses the mortality rate in that demographic is dramatically higher than we've seen with other viruses. You know, there's so much. This is what we keep hearing, too, from the health professionals. Unknown. We just don't know at this point, you know, really, is it going to ease off, taper off? Will warm weather, that was the, the presumption, the theory that warm weather will see this virus taper off. But Singapore, we see it happening there, and Singapore is warm. 
Um, and they're so comparing this more like SARS than the mm -hmm. influenza, which, you know, is not seasonal. So this could continue right through, you know, the weather heating yeah. up into the summer. And, and the unknowns. But one known is it is disrupting. We've seen the markets just on a roller coaster. <laughs> We've seen, you know, the industries being hit by it. Locally, we're seeing disruption in what we had events planned that are not going to be happening. Yeah, the list of events that will go on, and we're talking about all events, public, private, you name it. The list of events that are not canceled is going to be much easier to share than the list that is or schools canceled. that are open versus schools that are remote learning. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be an interesting debate. You know, we talked about we had time to plan for it, but because of the unknowns, because it's novel, because it's new, there's no thresholds or benchmarks or definitions for when do you close schools? When do you cancel well, are events? Are you proactive or reactive and which mm -hmm. makes more sense, too? And, and we've seen this debate playing out very publicly between elected officials. The mayor moved very quickly once there were three confirmed cases to start the cancellations. But the lieutenant governor said, wait, wait, no, there's no reason to cancel anything. Mm -hmm. And other politicians fell on either side or somewhere in the middle. And so it's a very interesting, and it's gonna take a long time for this public debate to unfold, but there's no play, you know, there's no, there's no playbook for this. And we know that isolation works very well, but people don't want to be isolated. A story came out of LSU this week that there was someone who had been to Wuhan who came back and did not want to be isolated, apparently, so didn't tell anybody they had been there. And then it started, started the rumor mill started spinning and rolling and flying. The good news is that person was asymptomatic and doesn't appear that they had the virus, but it raised a lot of other questions. Well, it's causing some disruption in just our own local journalism market, right? Where there was a journalist uh, conference and an attendee has been um, diagnosed with coronavirus or, you know, supposedly yeah, he came, presumptive he diagnosis. He came to town and then left, but apparently while he was here was kind enough to share the virus. So we've had a number, uh, the last number I saw was as many as two dozen locals who attended that journalism conference self-isolated. Yeah, and that is, once again, just to be clear, not people who have been have tested positive mm -hmm. but are in self-isolation just out of an abundance That's of caution. caution. Right, they, haven't, they have not tested positive. To our knowledge, we don't know if they've even had tests done. Again, the test just became commercially available this week, and it's taking time for those labs to get the tests and then establish new guidelines for who can have a test. And then there's a whole other question. Who's going to pay for the testing? Initially, CDC was going to fund the testing. Well, as the... It's going to roll over to the insurance companies well, real soon. Well, that was the hope. The president met with the insurance companies mm -hmm. trying to find that, but the insurance companies didn't even have a billing code for it. Without a code, you can't bill them. And so we've been hearing stories about people who have been tested, came back negative, and they get a bill for $800, dollars $1,000 by the time it's over for everyone involved in the testing, then the lab work, so on and so forth. So, again, more unknowns than knowns, and we're just at the beginning of this. Hopefully, the Chinese have been forthcoming, and the data from China is accurate, that the number of new cases is steadily declining in China. I think we'll have a better test in Italy, because we're more likely to get better information about what's really happening there. But and the other reason why months and months before we're going to be done with it. And Italy might be a better comparison than China, which is you know a more authoritarian right. regime, exactly. where all kinds of you know quarantine and isolation was easily ordered there. Much different than the U.S. and in particular a city like New Orleans. Right. Yeah. In China, they can tell you to stay home, and if you don't, there are severe consequences, so people stay home. Yeah. Italy, they've been trying it with mixed results. They want everybody in Italy to stay home. Yeah, we'll have to see how many people actually hit that parade route for no parade tomorrow. Yeah, each morning you wake up and wonder, you know, what's out in the world today. Um, but certainly washing those hands, that, that's still really good advice. You can't find hand sanitizer if you try to, you know, find it on the shelves. It's gone. And definitely you see a change in behavior with people grabbing those little sanitizing cloths when you walk into a market or something and see more and more people yeah. wiping the their carts is, down. The key is don't touch your face. No. Don't put your hands anywhere near your do. mouth. No. Your nose. Well, right now, you know, my nose is itching like crazy just because we're talking about it. <laughs> it my you, eyes. But, but it turns out you can touch your nose. Just not well, your eye. <laughs> well, it's awfully yeah. close now. <laughs> so, but no, really, if you 
the, the key is you keep your hands away from your face. Right. So the virus, even if you get it on your hands, which you're likely to do at some point, does not get into your body. Right. Okay, guys. All righty, let's move on to the next one. Thanks a lot for that discussion. Mike, we're going to go over to you now on something a little bit different, a little bit closer to home. Frenchman Street Bar Brawl. And then also there was one on Bourbon Street on Lindy Grub. But let's get to Frenchman first. And an arrest made on a bouncer. Right. And, you know, this was, uh, you know, uh, a very fruitful story for broadcast because there was so much video available, a security camera inside of the Frenchman nightclub, a camera outside the nightclub, which caught some of the action as it spilled into the street into an actual brawl. And then, of course, that attracted a large crowd of people with cell phones who took cell phone video of arrests being made and what have you. So what uh, was unusual about this was it was a disruption at a bar with a group of tourists from Mississippi. Um, the primary instigators, or identified as the instigators, were a couple and their 21-year-old college son. Uh, they were being asked to leave the club after a disruption. When they did not go peacefully, uh, they started taking it out on the doorman, security guard, uh, and a manager, and other employees of the place tried to escort them out. When they resisted, it got a little forceful. And before you knew it, this what you can see on the video is the doorman, is a rather large guy being dragged into the street and members of the you know, tourist group jumping on top of him. At various stages, shoes were flying, a bottle was thrown at the door and at the bouncer, punches were thrown. Uh, the Mississippi dad ended up with a broken nose, bleeding, as you can see on the video. Another thing that was rather alarming, especially to the onlookers, was he fiddles around and pulls out a gun at one point, brandishes a pistol. Eventually, 911's called. State police descend on the scene. They do make arrests of, you know, mom, dad, and the 21-year-old son on municipal charges of disturbing the peace, drunk in public relatively minor. They had an ROR waiting for them so they didn't have to, you know, remain locked up at, um, you know, parish lockup. But what was unusual was a couple days later, the troopers came back with an arrest warrant for the bouncer, who uh, all the employees of the establishment and many, many witnesses were saying, wait a minute, this guy's the victim. Now, I should point out a major element of this was it was racially tinged, the doorman being African-American, the Mississippi group being white and uh, using, according to all witnesses, racial slurs, um, a barrage of them. Mm -hmm. So it rubbed some people the wrong way that they then came back with not the kind of municipal charge that was lodged against the tourists, but a state felony second degree battery, which is reserved for when someone suffers a serious injury. Well, this person ended up nine days in jail and he got some you know, defense attorneys who were able to pull the video, do the research, talk to witnesses, present this to the district attorney's office. And again, in another quick turn of this case, the DA's office refused the charge against the bouncer, dismissed, dropped, over, he was cleared and released, and then upgraded the charges against the Mississippi group hmm. to state charges. Now, of course, unlike municipal, that forced him to come to court, to post bail, and hire, you know, defense counsel. So that's where the case stands now, but it is still rubbing some people the wrong way. Well, Mike, I saw some footage where you were trying to um, interview the family as they were walking away. It looked like one of them tried to, to push you. Well, no, uh, it wasn't a push. <laughs> or hit you with it an It was umbrella. the 21-year-old who... You would think they'd be on their best behavior, having to come from Jackson, Mississippi, and post bail sober in, in the morning after a court appearance. He immediately lashes out with his umbrella. Okay. He tries to hit us with his umbrella, missed. I think it hit the camera of my photographer and it started to disintegrate in a pretty strong rainstorm. So there was some almost comic relief as he's. I continued to try to talk to them and get answers as he's walking with a disintegrating umbrella, it's pouring down <laughs> rain. But if that's any indicator of you know, him showing Behavior. his true colors, his real personality, 
that was a, a rather interesting way to answer a question, flashing perhaps a hot temper. Real quick touch on the story. There was Lindy Grass story, former state uh, trooper, uh, state superintendent, state police superintendent. Well, yeah, maybe. And, a, and, a, and you know, and a brawl also had, was now, punched. You know, perhaps these hunt. stories come in bunches, or maybe because there's video everywhere now right. that we see these <laughs> brawls and fights that unfold on public Which streets. Which he said it was trying to break up the fight. But this but. one involved the former state police su superintendent, Mike Edmondson. And in this particular instance, he got bloodied. He yeah. got scratched very badly. and um, One of his friends a, was sucker punched, right. so they say, describe it, head injury. Now, that was very unfortunate that a member of a group that was with Edmondson, they had you know gone to brunch at Brennan's and were out on the street partying on Lundy Gras, but he got a, a blindside punch that led to him, you know, falling onto the pavement, cracking his head, suffered a very serious injury, um, <coughs> a concussion, and some brain hemorrhaging. He's still seeking neurological treatment. That wow. led to the, um, they finally caught the person who threw that punch, and he got arrested for second degree battery, as well as a simple battery on Mike Edmondson. So he's forced to, you know, come and post bail, mm -hmm. awaiting trial, but it could lead to an interesting scenario of. Colonel Mike Edmondson being a witness and taking the witness stand if there is a trial. Okay. All right. Best to stay away from fighting, I guess. I That's a lesson so. learned there. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Alcohol. Don, over to you. City Park. <laughs> Let's talk about beautiful City Park. Has some more plans for City Park? We will. We'll talk about beautiful City Park. We will circle back to coronavirus just briefly because it's impacting places like City Park, yeah. too, where private events and public events end up getting canceled. And City Park's revenue stream, it's a 90-10 park. They raise 90% of their own money. They get 10% of their money from the state. For the future of City Park, however, there was a vote last year in Orleans Parish that will give City Park some share of, of dollars, tax dollars raised, which will turn over their business model, if you will, to an 80-20 model. That's still worse than almost every other park in the country, that they have to raise 80% of their own revenue and they get 20%, but it will be a dream to them since they've always operated at 90, 10 or worse. So it's doubling um, what they're going to It's doubling, get from exactly. Government. And they'll be able to do things like deferred maintenance and capital improvements. And they've been working long and hard really since Katrina on a long range master plan, which you've seen come to fruition in things like the Great Lawn and the Children's Museum being there and City Putt and the dog park and you name it, the, I mean, expansion of the sculpture garden. Some of the projects they're working on now as part of that master plan is redevelopment of the Wisner track. That's the former East Golf Course. Mm -hmm. um, they've had lots and lots of public meetings. That's going to be a kind of different area of the park. A lot of the park is dedicated to recreation, kind of active crowds, cars have to come in, soccer fields softball fields, baseball fields. This one will be more of a place of respite with walking trails and more planting. And so they're working on the drain, they'll build new drainage and, and plant a lot of local trees and flowers. And it'll be just more of a quiet, be in nature kind of area of the park. They're also working on a new stormwater project that was supposed to originally be part of the city's urban water plan. Mm -hmm but got defunded on that. They have now gotten in um, a hazard mitigation grant, which will allow them to clean and deepen uh, the water features or lagoons north of, I uh, or north of 610 for the most part, and open up those waterways to recreation, to oh, canoeing and kayaking and, and all that. Hasn't been able to be in there because they've been mm -hmm. filled in or they have debris in them. So that should be... And the whole lagoon system is man-made. It's, it's a marvel of, a, of well, engineering. And expanding them and deepening them is where the stormwater comes into it. They, they can take much more runoff. Mm -hmm. It can be an area where when there is a big storm, more water can it's head can into City it. Park and get off of our streets. Um, that should be by the end of the year. They're talking now about a possible expansion of the train there, not just as a fun ride in the amusements, but, that, but actually as a way from area to area within as, the as park. As real transport? As transport. Um, I have to expand the seats a little there. It, they're, yeah. they're a little <laughs> small. Um, the water park feature that was part of the master plan right now is un not funded by the state, but it is something that may come up again. Um, let's see. Well, that's um, a whole lot. It is a whole lot. And books. Bob Becker, who has been the general manager of the mm -hmm. park for the last 19 years, has done a really stellar job Indeed, in building the park back up after Hurricane Katrina, is set to retire in the next few weeks. 
um, his successor should be named. Uh, Next few weeks to month, his successor should be named, and he'll stay on for a little while to help with the transition, mm -hmm. but then Bob said, then please just say hello to me if you see me running or walking with my dog in the park. Oh, those are big shoes to fill because Lord, what a job he's done. And it's the 170th anniversary of the park and this it's such, year. It's such a, a beautiful urban space. Okay, really that stormwater management piece is long overdue. Oh, that yes. is yeah. by far the largest available green space for that type of project, so it's good to see that's back online. And Important it's a too. park that gets okay. about 16 million visits a year and just came up on a list of one of the 10 reasons to okay. visit the city of New Orleans. We've got to move on to E. Thanks, Don. Let's talk quick about presidential primaries. Well, you know, when, when the forefathers created the uh, uh, our form of government, they created this uh, office called the presidency, and they said that this president shall be elected not by the people but by the states, which is why we call the country the United States. Um, and then they said, and so the states shall select who the people are who will vote for the president, hence the beginning of the Electoral College. They never figured out or said how you get the people who are part of the Electoral College. They never mentioned political parties. And so all this has evolved, and we're still evolving that part of the presidential election system. So for the, the past few presidential elections, we've had this primary system. And Louisiana has never known quite where to fit. Uh, it's kind of late in the primary season. The primary is in April. And at one part, the, the thinking was, well, you know, this is a good idea because by April you're down to the last few real contenders, and so Louisiana can be in a bargaining spot. Well, as it turns out, th there is no bargaining. It's going to mm -hmm. be uh, Joe Biden. I mean, it, it, it's pretty much decided uh, right now. Bernie Sanders is just lagging seriously in this. And so it's really not going to have that much significance in terms of the whole, the whole national picture. But the, um, the April primary, there's three primaries. There's Louisiana, there's Hawaii, and Alaska that day. And somewhere in this nation, there's the ultimate political geek who will stay up to get the last results from, uh, from uh, 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 Hawaii. Hawaii and Alaska. None of which, you can add them all together, and they're going to have that, that much of an impact on the presidential election. But at least it gives us a chance to get a little bit of attention. And those are the final primaries? No, so no, there's a few more after that. There's still some more after that. More yeah. later in the cycle than we normally are when they got you know, moved right. later in the calendar. Yeah. yeah, there was briefly some excitement. It looked like before Super Tuesday that Louisiana would still be in mm -hmm. play right. and that it wouldn't matter. Yeah. But now it really yeah. is looking like really it really changed out after Super Tuesday. Yeah. And so. All right. April 4th is our primary day. Dave, over to you. Hard Rock, um, the collapse of that uh, building. It's supposed to be imploded in the month of March, but that's, well, that's really no, not going to happen? Well, March will end it and it and will went, still huh? be standing yeah. there. Uh, the primary will come April 4th, and it will still be sitting there in the exact same condition that it was October 12th, uh, well, minus the cranes, uh, but essentially the same condition as October 12th. Uh, at this point, there's bureaucratic impediments to moving forward with the demolition. There are issues with insurance. There are issues with getting contracts signed, with getting everything in place to make it happen. Uh, the money seems to be in order at this point, but... The process is taking much frustratingly longer than I think anybody wants. Everybody says they want it to go more quickly. The government wants it to go quickly. The developers, the owners want it to go more quickly. But the reality is it's not. And so the best estimate they have now is sometime in April the demolition will happen. Well, there's a lot going on in April. And so now, you know, you couldn't do it before Mardi Gras or during Mardi Gras, but now you look at, okay, well, now April, what's going to be going on with coronavirus in April? What... Mm -hmm will be going on with, with tourism, festivals. with festivals. There's just so many, again, unknowns. But uh, the process is at least inching along at this point. Meanwhile, the investigations continue. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to hearing, hopefully sooner than later, from OSHA on at least an initial report of what they believed happened. At the same time, the investigation into the city's inspections office has been bearing more fruit, thanking, thanks in large part to the investigative efforts of television journalism mm -hmm. uh, and really on you know behalf of David Hammer, uh, finding that the evidence that investigators claim to have done investigations when GPS data showed they were never at the scene when they claimed to have done the investigations. Now, one of those two primary investigators who was accused of falsifying those records and claiming to have done investigations at Hard Rock when they didn't happen has resigned. Mm -hmm. The other is still suspended, and the investigation will continue. But how far that goes, we don't know yet. 
uh, waiting to see how much, if at all, the feds are involved in that investigation and if it progresses to a point where it becomes a criminal investigation. So the most immediate thing would be, it would seem, is the implosion, even though that is not too immediate at this point, no, uh, of the building itself. Will those three smaller buildings um, next, next to it, well, two right next to it and one, I think, behind it, are those going to come down beforehand, as we have been that told? Was Is the that plan. part of the plan? That was part of the plan. But again, uh, we'll go back to the word fluid. Uh, every time we think we know what's going to happen, we find out that it's not going to happen that way. So we'll continue to wait and see. But the emotion associated with this mm -hmm. kind of keeps ebbing and flowing. You know, we had the marches on City Hall. Right. We had the protests. We had the v candlelight vigils. But those seem to have faded away during Mardi Gras. Well, and the farther you get removed and from since, the actual incident, the, right. well, and the losses the haven't faded, though. No, and those will no. be coming more and more into the, into the light. And those two souls remaining in the building, that hasn't gone away either. No, it's but just, there's still like a tarp said, covering one of them. Right. All right, Dave. We're going to look ahead now, E. Yeah, well, first, uh, we'll, we'll look back briefly because yeah. uh, we lost this week uh, Ed Renwick. Uh, uh, he died last weekend, and he was probably the city's first really public political scientist, the one yeah. that, the, that the public knew. He started off at UNO, and I know both you and I had him as yeah. a teacher one time, and he was one of a, a political scientist who really knew to talk hardball politics. He was a good nuts and bolts kind of political guy. And then he went on to uh, Loyola, right. where he started the Institute of Politics, and a lot of people in political life today went to the IOP and learned about their politics from the IOP at Loyola. And, and journalism, he was, too. And he was also a pollster. He was a well-known pollster for many years. Uh, he was associated with Channel 4, and he would be their pollster, and then also sort of like their political analyst. So he was, a, he was the most well-known and, 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 and a witty uh, 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 political scientist. Right, a great storyteller, yeah. a political storyteller. I must okay, have interviewed he him a hundred times. Yeah. Uh, great guy. Great guy, really. So really our condolences to his family. He's a terrific guy. Dave. Looking ahead, uh, well, again, we don't know what's going to be happening, but we do. We know St. Patrick's Day will arrive next week. Right. And your question is, will there be any activities associated with it left on the list, either public or private? It's fluid. But we'll always have your shirt. <laughs> yeah, I wore the green shirt. <laughs> Done. A new feature at City Park starting on Friday and Saturday nights, the Swan Boats will be available lit up, LED lit up, oh, um, on the big lake until 10 o'clock at night. So oh, a nice pretty outing and even just pretty to go see the boats lit up on the big lake there. Yeah, that's going to be really lovely. Mike. Well, a rare thing in journalism, an actual uplifting and very gratifying story for me. We covered the case of Jamal Cox, who got life without parole on a three strikes or out multiple bill. After two and a half years of following his case, he got that reversed and re walked out of Angola into the arms of his loving family and friends uh, this week. and is resettling back into the free world, uh, resentenced from life to four years. So what we wow. had been showing that it was uh, an unfair and extreme sentence turned out to be uh, agreed upon by the judge and the okay. DA of St. Tammany. A real impact of reporting. Okay, guys, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you all for joining us. See you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.